Hey everyone, in this video we're writing a compiler for our own programming language that we made and interpreted in the previous video. The programming language and compiler are very simple, so they are great for getting started and gaining an intuition for how the compilation process works. First, I will be going over all the building blocks required to create our compiler, then we will go over the assembly language that our compiler uses, and finally we will build the actual compiler itself and test it out. The compiler we are building consists of four main building blocks. The first step is taking the input code and parsing it to a list of tokens. Second, we will convert that list of tokens to a correct assembly program. Third, we will be using the NASM assembler in order to assemble our assembly program file into an object file. Our fourth and final step is to use a linker such as GCC to link and create our final executable. Let's discuss the assembly language that we will be using. When dealing with assembly languages, there are multiple variants, syntaxes, and writing conventions to choose from. Because assembly is so close to what actually runs on the hardware, these choices are dictated by the hardware and operating system it has to run on. We are going to use our compiler to create executables for a 64-bit Windows 10 machine that uses an Intel CPU. That is why the assembly language in this video will be using the x86-64 instruction set written using the Intel syntax. Because we are running a Windows 10 machine, we will use the Microsoft x64 calling convention. If all this assembly jargon is starting to sound complicated, I assure you this compiler will be very simple and you can easily follow along with me. I am far from an expert on this topic, so I've put some resources in the description where you can learn more about everything that I have and will talk about. Some honorable mentions of the resources I used are Tsoding Daily's Porth Compiler series, the ASM tutorial by Sonic TK, and the Building a Compiler playlist by Imo Landworth. Now that we have all the information required to get started, let's create a compiler.py file for our compiler program, and four additional files containing example programs written in our own programming language, which we can use to test our compiler at various stages. The first building block of the compiler is parsing the input code to a list of tokens. And in order to do so, we need the file path to the file containing the code. So we import sys to utilize the command line arguments and store the program file path. If we print the program file path and run the following command to run our compiler, we can see that the file path to our code that we entered is stored in the program file path variable. Now that we have the file path to the code, we can start parsing the code. We read the lines of text from the file strip them from white spaces and store the lines in a list called program lines. Each line will either contain a label, an instruction, or just some white space. We create an empty list for our tokens, which we call program. And then our goal is to go over each line in the program lines and take the significant parts from that line and store them as a token in the programs list. So each token is just a word or single instruction from a program file. We say for each line in program lines, split the line into parts using space, and then we take the first element of the parts list and call it opcode. We check if the opcode is an empty string, and if it is, we continue to the next line, because we know this is just an empty line containing white space. If it is not an empty line, we append the opcode to the list of tokens, because it must be either a label or an instruction. Some instructions come with an argument, which we also need to store in our tokens list. These instructions are push, print, jump when equal to zero, and jump when greater than zero. When the push instruction is used, we expect something like push 10. So we extract the number by taking the next part of the line and converting it to an integer. And we then append that number to the list of tokens. For print, we expect a string literal after the instruction. And our string literal might have spaces in it, which would have been split when we split our line. So to extract the string literal, we join all the rest of the parts using a space, and then we remove the quotation marks around the string literal, and then also append it to the list of tokens. The instructions jump when equal to zero and jump when greater than zero both expect a label as argument, which we can simply get from the next part of the split line, and it is then also appended to the list of tokens. You can give yourself a pat on the back, because we have now created the first building block of our compiler. We can print the list of tokens and run the compiler on the first program to see its code as a list of tokenized instructions. And as you can see, the list contains all the separate elements of the code, but no longer contains any white spaces unless they are contained within a string literal. We can now create the second building block, which is responsible for converting the list of tokens into a valid assembly program. Our strategy to create the assembly program is going to be to go over each of the tokens one by one, 
and convert each token and its optional argument into an assembly equivalent, which we output to an assembly file with the same name as our program file. So we start by creating the assembly file file path, then we open and create that file in order to write lines to it. And keep in mind that if you open a file like this in Python, you also need to close it once you're done with it. The first thing we write to our assembly file are instructions for our assembler, NASM. We specify that we're creating a 64-bit program and that we want to use relative addressing. Next, we'll create three sections in our assembly file. We'll create a .bss section for uninitialized variables. We'll create a .data section for initialized constants. And we'll create a .text section for our assembly logic. We'll start by adding stuff to our .text section and use the .data and .bss section later when we need them. We start our text section by saying global main. This tells the assembly program to start at the function called main, which we will create in a little bit. Next, we import some external functions. Exit process from the Windows API to correctly end our assembly program and printf and scanf from the C standard library to write to the terminal and read user input. The reason we can use printf and scanf from the C standard library is because we use GCC as our linker. Next, we create a label called main, which is the entry point to the program that we previously defined. Now, the final bit of code we have to add before we can start translating our tokens has to do with the Microsoft x86 calling convention. This calling convention exists so that we can correctly call and be called by external functions also using this convention. To follow this calling convention, we must allocate something called shadow space right after our main label. The shadow space is some empty size allocated on the stack, which has a minimum size of 32 bytes. We don't actually use this empty shadow space ourselves, but it is used by things such as debuggers. In order to create the shadow space, we first push the base pointer to the stack, then we set the base pointer equal to the current stack pointer, moving it to the last element of the assembly stack, and then we subtract 32 from the stack pointer in order to allocate 32 bytes of free space on the stack. Now let's get started translating some actual tokens into assembly. We create our instruction pointer called IP, and we use it together with a while loop to run through all the tokens in our list of tokens. We take whatever the instruction pointer is pointing at and call it opcode, and we increment the instruction pointer to the next token. If our opcode ends with a colon, we know we're dealing with a label, and the labels in our language are equivalent to those in assembly. So we output a comment that we're placing a label, and then we output the actual opcode itself, which is the name of the label plus the colon. Then we check if our opcode is the push instruction. If it is, we know that our instruction pointer is now pointing to the number we want to push, so we extract that number from the list of tokens and increment the instruction pointer. We then write to the assembly file a comment saying we're going to push, and we write the assembly equivalent of pushing the number, which is push the number. To handle the pop instruction, we don't expect any arguments, and we can just write the assembly equivalent of popping from the stack to the file. As you can see, all the instructions till now were quite straightforward in their translation to assembly. For the next two instructions add and sub, we're going to start using assembly registers. These have specific names like RAX, RBX, RCX, etc. and they can be used to store any 64-bit value. If we look at the definition for our add operation, we see that we want to pop the top two numbers from the stack, and then we want to add them and push the result to the stack. And we could do a similar thing in assembly. We could pop the first value into RAX, and then pop the second value into RBX, and then use the add instruction to add RBX to RAX, storing the result in RBX, and finish by pushing the value RBX to the stack. Even though this is equivalent to our add instruction, because assembly has more instructions than our language, there is a shorter and more efficient way of computing the same result. Let me write it down and then explain it. We pop the first value into the RAX register. Then we say, take the value which the stack pointer is pointing to and add RAX to it, and then store the result wherever the stack pointer is pointing. In this line, we encounter two new things, square brackets, which indicates the value that a pointer is pointing to. In this case, we want the value that the stack pointer is pointing to. The second new thing we see is keyword, which simply indicates eight bytes. So keyword in combination with the square brackets around the stack pointer, grab the eight byte value that the stack pointer is pointing at. We can take a similar approach with our sub instruction. We pop the first value off the stack and place it into the RAX register. And then we take the second value at the top of the stack and subtract RAX from it and store the result at the top of the stack. 
to not introduce too much complexity and be able to run an example file as soon as possible, we will skip the implementation of the print and read instructions for now. And we will simply output an assembly comment saying that they're not yet implemented. After the print and read instruction, we get to the jump when equal to zero instruction. And this instruction expects a label to jump to as argument. To create the assembly equivalent, we're going to use the compare assembly instruction. And we will say compare the eight bytes at the top of the stack with the number zero. Depending on the comparison, the compare operation sets different flags, which are basically different true and false values, which can be checked in order to see what the previous comparison resulted in. One of the things that makes use of these flags is the jump when equal to instruction or JE. JE looks at the equals flag and if the equals flag is set to one, then we jump to wherever the label is. To handle the next opcode, jump when greater than zero, we perform similar steps. We first extract the label from the tokens and then we use the comparison instruction again in order to compare the top of the stack with the number zero. And then we use a slightly different jump operation, which says jump when greater than JG. And we jump to the label. Finally, we deal with the halt opcode for which we'll simply say output the assembly jump to exit label. We have now handled all the instructions except print and read, and we can exit the while loop knowing that all the tokens have been correctly converted into valid assembly. After having converted all the tokens, we add the exit label, set the RAX register to zero, which is part of the calling convention, and call the exit process Windows API function. This is the code that is executed whenever the halt opcode is encountered and it correctly exits our program. We can then close the assembly file we have created. Congratulations, we have now finished the second building block required in our compiler. The third and fourth building block are gonna be very short, so stick around for them. And let's first take a look at the beautiful assembly that is created by our compiler. We compile this simple program written in our little language. And as you can see, we produce an equivalent assembly file containing a main function, which pushes 10 to the stack, then pushes seven to the stack, then adds 10 and seven together, placing the result at the end of the stack. And finally, we see it correctly translating the halt operation, jumping to the exit label, and properly exiting our program by calling the exit process function. Let's now create building blocks three and four of our compiler, run the entire compiler to make sure it doesn't give any errors, and then add the print instruction so we can actually see some output when we run our compiled programs. To create building blocks three and four, we need to import OS. Then we can use OS to perform terminal commands. To create our assembly building block, we run the following command, nasm format to l64, and then our file path to our assembly program. Boom, third building block done. Let's create the fourth building block, which links our program and creates an executable. We say run the command gcc, that should output a file with the same name ending in .exe, and it should link and create the executable file using the object file created by the NASM assembler. Finally, to make the testing of our compiler a little easier, we'll execute another terminal command, which runs the compiled.exe executable. Great, we can now run the compiler again, passing the file path to program zero. And as you can see, we are parsing, assembling, linking, and running our program without any errors. Let's now handle the print opcode so we can finally see some output in the terminal when we run our programs. In order to implement print in assembly, we're going to call the external C function printf. And as you may know, the printf function expects one or more variables. The x64 Microsoft calling convention states that the arguments passed to a function that is called are placed in order from left to right into rcx, then rdx, etc. It is important to know that when we're dealing with floating point values, we use completely different registers, and at any point a function takes more than four arguments, the additional arguments have to be pushed to the stack. But in our case, we only want to use printf to print a single string, which is the string literal, which is passed as an argument to our print opcode. Unfortunately, we can directly add the string literal and load it into the RCX register. So instead, we need to create a constant in the dot data section and then use the pointer to that constant and load that into the RCX register. So we need to go back above our while loop and go to the dot data section. And just above the dot data section, we're gonna create an additional for loop, which loops over our tokens. 
and if we encounter a string literal, we'll store it in a list containing all the string literals. And we will replace the token that was the string literal itself to the index of that string literal in the list of string literals. Now we can go back to our dot data section where we can define our constants. And we can loop over the index and the string literal in the list of string literals. And for each string literal, we write to the file the name of the constant, which will be string underscore literal underscore the index. Then we use db to indicate that each character should be stored in a single byte. Then we pass the string literal itself, comma zero, indicating that the string should end with a null terminator. Now that we have added all the string literals as constants, let's run our compiler again and see our assembly code. As you can see, the dot data section now contains the constant string literal zero, hello world. But we still haven't used the string literal yet. So let's go back to our while loop where we handle our print opcode. First, we use the LAE instruction to load the pointer to the string literal into the RCX register. Then we adhere to the calling convention and set the EAX register to zero and call the printf function thus passing the pointer to the string literal to the printf function as the first argument. Now having implemented our print opcode, let's compile program zero again to see if hello world is being printed to the terminal. And as you can see, it is. Let's check if we can compile and run some of the other programs we have written in our programming language. If we compile program one and look at the assembly file, we see that we have not yet implemented the read opcode. But for testing purposes, we can go to the program one code file and replace the read opcodes by pushing specific numbers. We will also do this to programs two and three. We can now compile and run program one to see that 19 and 19 are indeed equal. We can run program two to see that 420 is indeed even. And we can finally compile and run program three to see that the number 69 is divisible by three. I once again congratulate you for reaching this point, since we're now almost done creating the full compiler for our little language. And by now I hope you've built up an understanding and intuition for how a very basic compiler might work. Let's go ahead and finish off our compiler by implementing the read opcode. To implement the read opcode, we're gonna use the external C function scanf. Scanf takes two arguments, the first being a format string, and the second being a pointer to the location where the value entered by the user should be stored. Both the format string and the pointer to the variable containing the user input still need to be created. So we go to the dot data section and we add a constant called read format, specifying with db that each character is one byte. The string itself is percent %d, indicating that we're reading an integer and then comma zero again to specify that the string should end with a null terminator. We then go to the .bss section to create our variable which will hold the user input. We call it read number. We use resq to indicate that we want to reserve a space equal to one quad word, which is eight bytes. We say one to indicate that the read number variable is one times eight bytes in size. Great, let's now go back to the while loop and finish handling the read opcode. We use LEA to load the pointer to the format string into the RCX register. We use the same instruction again to load a pointer to the variable that is going to store the user input into the RDX register. Then we follow the calling convention by setting the EAX register to zero, and we can then call the scanf function. Once it is done, we push the eight byte sized value of the number that is read to the stack. And ladies and gentlemen, we are done with our compiler. Let's go to our program files and convert our pushes back into read opcodes. We compile and run program one and see that the values 10 and 12 are not equal. We compile and run program two to see that the value 233 is odd. And finally, we run program three to see that the value 127 is not divisible by three. I genuinely hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. It took a lot of time to make, so a like or a comment is very much appreciated. And if you want to see more content like this, consider subscribing for more. Have a nice day. Peace.